This is Space Time, Series 23, Episode 138. Coming up on Space Time, what if scientists have got dark matter all wrong? I mean, could something called modified Newtonian physics fix it? NASA's Juno spacecraft updates a quarter-century-old Jupiter mystery, and the new Sentinel-6 spacecraft sends back its first sea-level measurements. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Here's something worth pondering. What if scientists have got dark matter all wrong? After all, we only know dark matter exists because we can actually see its gravitational interaction with normal matter, holding galaxies together as they rotate. And it's pretty much based on that that scientists have concluded that dark matter comprises more than three quarters of all the mass in the universe. And this has been the prevailing hypothesis for nearly 50 years now. An alternative view held by a very small but growing section of the scientific community, is called MOND, or Modified Newtonian Physics. Now, a new study has shown that MOND more accurately predicts a galactic phenomenon that appears to defy the classic Newtonian rules of gravity. It's significant because it further establishes the hypothesis of modified Newtonian dynamics as a viable explanation for a cosmological dilemma, that galaxies appear to buck the long-accepted rules of gravity traced back to Isaac Newton in the late 1600s. Modified Newtonian physics theory was first introduced by physicist Mordechai Milgram, the Weizmann Institute in Israel, in the early 1980s. In simple terms, it says the extra gravitational pull which we attribute to dark matter actually exists because the rules of gravity are slightly altered. Mon suggests that gravity at low accelerations is stronger than predicted simply by pure Newtonian understanding. Mon also makes the bold prediction that the internal motions of an object not only depends on the mass of that object itself, but also on the gravitational pull from all the other masses in the universe, what's called the external field effect. Now, a report in the Astrophysical Journal claims to have detected this external field effect in more than 150 galaxies. One of the study's authors, Stacy McGough from Case Western Reserve University, says the external field effect is a unique signature of MOND and doesn't occur in Newtonian-Einstein gravity. The results clearly support MOND rather than dark matter hypothesis. And it's not a once-only anomaly. The authors analysed 153 rotation curves of disk galaxies as part of their study. They deduced the external field effect by observing that galaxies in strong external fields slowed or exhibited declining rotational curves more frequently than galaxies in weaker external fields, and that's exactly what's predicted by MOND. And despite lots of initial scepticism, months of follow-up checking have only confirmed the accuracy of the initial observations. And the thing is, they can't think of another explanation which can explain the exact behaviour they're observing. This is space time. Still to come, NASA's Juno spacecraft updates a quarter-century-old Jupiter mystery, and the Sentinel-6 spacecraft provides its first sea-level measurements. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Twenty-five years ago, NASA sent its Galileo spacecraft on a suicide death plunge into the atmosphere of the solar system's largest planet, Jupiter. But the information returned during its descent wasn't what was expected. The reading showed the atmosphere it was plunging through was much denser and hotter than had been predicted. Now, new data from Juno, NASA's latest mission to the Jovian system, suggests that these hot spots are much wider and deeper than had previously been anticipated. The findings on Jupiter's hotspots, along with an update on Jupiter's polar cyclones, were revealed at a conference of the American Geophysical Union. Juno principal investigator Scott Bolton from the Southwest Research Institute in San Antonio, Texas, says unlike the Earth or the other terrestrial worlds, gas giants like Jupiter have deep atmospheres without a solid or liquid base. To better understand what's happening deep inside one of these worlds, you need to look below the cloud layer. And Juno, which has just completed its 29th Jovian orbit, is equipped with a scientific instrument package that can do just that. 
The latest long-standing mystery Juno's tackled stems from 57 minutes and 36 seconds of data which Galileo beamed back to Earth on December 7, 1995. Scientists were surprised when the 34-kilogram probe described its surroundings during its atmospheric descent as dry and windy. They attributed the findings to the spacecraft travelling through one of Jupiter's relatively rare hotspots. Think of them as localised atmospheric deserts that traverse the gas giant's northern equatorial region. But the new results from Juno's microwave instrument indicates that the entire northern equatorial belt, a broad brown cyclonic band that wraps right around the planet just above its equator, is generally all very dry. The implication is that the hotspots may not be isolated deserts at all, but rather windows into a vast region of Jupiter's atmosphere that may well be hotter and drier than other areas. Juno's high-resolution data shows that these Jovian hotspots are associated with breaks in the planet's cloud deck, providing a glimpse deeper into Jupiter's atmosphere. They also show that the hotspots, which are flanked by clouds and active storms, are fueling high-altitude electrical discharges recently discovered by Juno, which has been dubbed shallow lightning. These shallow lightning discharges, which occur in the cold upper reaches of Jupiter's atmosphere when ammonia mixes with water, are a piece of this puzzle. High up in the atmosphere with the shallow lightning scene, water and ammonia are combined and become invisible to Juno's microwave instrument. This is where a special kind of hailstone known as mush balls are formed. These mush balls get heavy and fall deeper into the atmosphere, creating a large region that's depleted in both ammonia and water. Once the mush balls melt and evaporate, the ammonia and water change back into a gaseous state and are visible once again to Juno's instruments. Another observation by Juno reported on cyclones at the Jovian South Pole. Juno's Jovian Infrared Auroral Mapper instrument captured images of a new cyclone appearing to attempt to join the five established cyclones revolving around a massive central cyclone at the South Pole. This sixth cyclone, I guess you'd call it the baby of the group, appeared to be changing the geometric configuration at the pole from a pentagon into a hexagon. But it now seems the attempt failed. The baby cyclone got kicked out, it moved away and has now disappeared. At present, Juno scientists don't have an agreed theory as to how these giant polar vortexes are formed, or why some appear stable while others are born, grow and then die relatively quickly. Work continues on atmospheric models, but the thing is at present there is no one model that appears to explain everything. How new storms appear, evolve and are either accepted or rejected would be key to understanding circumpolar cyclones, which might help explain how the atmospheres of these giant planets work in general. This is space time. Still to come, the newly launched Sentinel-6 provides its first sea level measurements. And the United States launches a big new spy satellite on one of its biggest heavy lift launches, the giant Delta IV Heavy. All that and more coming up on Space Time. The joint NASA-European Space Agency Copernicus Sentinel-6 spacecraft, Michael Freelish, has sent back its first measurements since last month's launch. The data on sea surface height, wave height and wind speed were taken off the southern tip of Africa. Since its launch on November 21st aboard a Falcon 9 rocket from the Vandenberg Air Force Base in California, mission managers have spent several weeks initiating and calibrating the spacecraft's scientific instruments. Sentinel-6 continues a decades-long project to measure global ocean heights from space, which began in the early 1990s. Since then, the rate of sea level rise has doubled, with the current rate being around 4 mm per year. The rise is caused almost entirely by a combination of meltwater from land-based glaciers and ice sheets and the fact that seawater expands when it warms. The initial orbit of Sentinel-6 is some 18.4 km lower than its ultimate operational orbit of 1,336 km above the Earth's surface. And mission managers are now moving the spacecraft up into its final operational orbit, where it will trail behind the Jason-3 satellite by 30 seconds. During this tandem flight, scientists and engineers will spend the next 6-12 to 12 months cross-calibrating the data between the two spacecraft. That way, they'll ensure the continuity of measurements between the pair. And once cross-calibration is complete, Sentinel-6 will become the primary sea-level satellite. 
In addition to measuring sea level height, Sentinel-6 is also monitoring atmospheric temperature and humidity, which will help improve weather and storm forecasts. The spacecraft is one of two identical satellites that will extend a nearly 30-year-long sea level record collected by an ongoing collaboration between the United States and Europe. That record began back in 1992 with the Topex Poseidon spacecraft. It then continued with the Jason 1 in 2001, Jason 2 in 2008, and the current Jason 3, which has been observing the Earth's oceans since 2016. The work's also been cross-checked with Cryosat and the Copernicus Sentinel-3 spacecraft. In 2025, the 1.2-ton Sentinel-6 will pass the baton onto its twin, Sentinel-6b. Both spacecraft are part of the Sentinel-6 Jason CS mission, which will collect accurate measurements of sea surface height from more than 90% of the world's oceans. The satellites will also monitor atmospheric temperature and humidity, as well as wave height and wind speed, which will provide crucial information for operational oceanography, marine meteorology and climate studies. This report from ESA TV. Sentinel-6 will provide near real-time operational measurements of sea surface height wave height and wind speed. These measurements allow scientists to monitor sea level rise resulting from climate change from regional to local scale. The main instruments on board uh, include a dual frequency radar altimeter and this is the primary instrument of the mission and that's the one that's measuring sea surface height, significant wave height and wind speed over the ocean and from those measurements we can actually have uh, the superb measurements that we expect um, of sea level rise but also the waves. Uh, this is important for marine operations and the altimeters provide perhaps some of them uh, the best uh, data sets that we have today uh, over the, the global ocean. We have plenty of buoys in the ocean uh, that measure uh, waves, but they're often in the coastal zone. And it's only when you go to uh, the altimetry uh, that you can really have this, this global coverage. This brand new radar altimeter is called Poseidon 4 and offers very precise high resolution altimetry measurements. Other instruments are used together with the altimeter to improve its accuracy. With its high precision measurements, Sentinel-6 will be the reference mission for all other altimetry missions. And measurements of other satellites will be compared to the data from Sentinel-6. At first, Sentinel-6 will also fly in tandem with Jason-3, with only 30 seconds between both satellites. This is important to understand and homogenize the differences between successive missions and ensure that the time series of sea level measurements from space remains stable. Long time series are important to understand climate change and monitor a gradual process such as sea level rise. They help scientists gauge exactly how much sea levels are rising and how fast it's happening. We, we, with a, a long record, we can precisely measure the acceleration we eventually can detect new regime, tipping points. For example, if there is a runaway in the melting of Greenland or Antarctica, sea level uh, will uh, record this uh, runaway change uh, because it is an integrator of all changes that are occurring in the, in the climate system. So we, we will be able to see some, some change, big change in, in, uh, in the global climate. Uh, I would like to add also that uh, a long record is very important to validate the climate models that are developed to simulate future change. Sentinel-6 will extend and enhance a series of measurements started by the Topex Poseidon mission in 1992. This mission was succeeded by the Jason 1, 2 and 3 missions. And now Sentinel-6 is taking us to the next level. The orbit in which Sentinel-6 will fly is optimized for limited interference from ocean tide changes. And after almost three decades of radar altimetry missions, it's well known to scientists. By continuing and enhancing this time series with a new satellite design, and high-resolution instruments, Sentinel-6 will allow for further climate research and help scientists monitor the effects of climate change 
Its data can also be used to improve ocean and weather forecasting, map sea mounts, and other tectonic features of the sea floor, and map rivers and lakes for hydrology purposes such as water and flood management. Sentinel-6 is part of the European Copernicus program and will complement the largest operational Earth observation program in the world. If you think about how, in an Earth system context, Copernicus spacecraft are providing more when they're used together. For example, Sentinel-3 is providing the sea surface temperature and the ocean biology measurements. Sentinel-1 is providing radar imaging measurements of ocean swell waves, of sea ice. Sentinel-2 provides high-resolution measurements in the coastal zone. And when these are used together, a wonderful view of the Earth's ocean can be achieved. It's almost like a painting. As you add more colour, you get a brilliant view of our wonderful planet. Sentinel-6 is a unique collaboration between the European Commission, ESA, UMETSAT, NASA and NOAA with the support of the French space agency, CNES. This teamwork underlines once more the satellite's importance and how the whole planet can both contribute and benefit from this vital mission. As sea level rises and our planet continues to change, the lives and livelihood of millions of people are at stake. With 10% of the world population living in coastal zones, less than 10 metres above sea level, we need accurate measurements to prepare and to mitigate the effects of sea level rise and climate change. The launch campaign is the culmination of many years of work. For me to be part of Earth's observation is special because you really do feel you're doing something that can help the future of mankind. Equipped with a radar altimeter, Sentinel-6 will make the most accurate measurements yet of sea level. A joint project between Europe and the United States, Sentinel-6 will continue the legacy of almost 30 years of radar altimetry missions, starting with Topex Poseidon in 1992, and continuing through Jason 1, 2 and 3, providing an accurate record of sea surface measurements and proving that mean global sea levels are rising. We want to continue that record for another five years and demonstrate and quantify the sea level rise we have been observing since the 90s, in average about 3.2 millimeters per year, even though the scientist tells us in the last year this has been accelerating, in particular due to the acceleration in melting of ice. So over the last years, it's above four millimeters every year we record in the sea level. Sentinel-6 will map up to 95% of the world's oceans every 10 days, taking continuous measurements of sea surface and wave height as well as wind speed. The satellite will also provide vital safety information for shipping through marine and meteorological forecasts. It will operate alongside other Sentinel satellites as part of the European Copernicus Earth Observation Program. And that report from ESA TV included Sentinel-6 ESA mission scientist Craig Donnellan, senior scientist Annie Karsvenev from the Institute of Geophysics and Oceanography, Sentinel-6 ESA launch campaign manager Bill Simpson, and Sentinel-6 project manager Perik Vuljamir. This is Space Time. Still to come. A United Launch Alliance Delta IV Heavy blasts into orbit carrying a new classified US spy satellite. And later in the science report, a new study confirms that Neanderthals buried their dead. All that and more still to come on Space Time. A United Launch Alliance Delta IV Heavy rocket is blasted into orbit, carrying a classified US spy satellite. The top-secret NROL-44 mission for the National Reconnaissance Office was flown from Space Launch Complex 37B at the newly renamed Cape Canaveral Space Force Station in Florida. Second stage locked, secure at flight level. FTS internal. CBC locks at flight pressure and flight level. CBC LH2 at flight pressure and flight level. Vehicle internal. Hydraulic pressure at 155. Launch sequencer start. FCS launch enables. The launch vehicle, payload, ground systems, and Eastern Range are go for launch. Status check. Go Delta. Go NROL 44. Roll for ignition. T minus 10, 10. 9, 8, 7, 
Six, five, main engine ignition. Three, two, one, zero, and liftoff. Liftoff, the United Launch Alliance Delta IV heavy rocket carrying the NRL 44 mission for the National Reconnaissance Office. On all three RCA engines look good in full press mode. Now 15 seconds into flight, able to begun the pitch over maneuver. Body range is fine. Good. You are hearing the voice of Patrick Moore providing launch vehicle assets data. 25 seconds into flight, engine operating parameters continue to look good. Body rate response will look good. Now 30 seconds in. Standing by for core booster throttle down when there. And core booster has begun throttling down as expected. The partial thrust level engine response looks good. Core booster has achieved partial thrust level as expected. Engine operating parameters continue to look good on all three engines. Delta IV is now 4.3 miles in altitude, 5.8 miles downrange distance, traveling at 1,200 miles per hour. Vehicle is now passing through max Q, maximum dynamic pressure. Vehicle is also passing Mach 1. Delta IV is now supersonic. Engine operating parameters continue to look good on all three boosters. Port and starboard booster in the full thrust mode, core booster in the partial thrust mode. Body rates continue to look stable throughout the boost phase of flight. Telemetry quality has looked good throughout the boost phase. And the second stage reaction control system is pressurizing to flight levels. System response looks good. Engine operating parameters on all three engines continue to look good. Vehicle has now gone to closed loop guidance. Seeing some correction in uh, the attitude as expected when vehicle switches over to closed loop guidance. And the Delta IV rocket now weighs just one half of what it did at liftoff, burning propellant at a rate of almost 5,000 pounds per second. Body rates in roll pitch and yaw have nulled out nicely now after the closed loop guidance switchover. And vehicle is now passing Mach 5. Engine operating parameters continue to look good. Port and starboard boosters in the full thrust mode, core booster in the partial thrust mode. And standing by for strap-on engines to throttle down. And strap-on engines have begun throttling down in preparation for engine cutoff. And port and starboard booster engines have cut off. And we've seen good indication of separation of the port and starboard boosters. Core booster is throttled back up to full thrust as expected. Uh, engine response looks good. And the upper stage liquid oxygen system has begun boost phase chill down sequence to begin thermal conditioning of the RL10 engine. And upper stage fuel system has now begun boost phase chill down. Core engine continuing to look good in the full thrust mode. Engine operating parameters look nominal. And the Delta IV is now 71 miles in altitude, 360 miles downrange distance, traveling at 12,900 miles per hour. And core booster has begun throttling down in preparation for BECO, standing by for BECO. And we have BECO, booster engine cutoff, standing by for stage separation. And we have good indication of separation of the first and second stages. Nozzle extension on the RL-10 is deploying. We have pre-start. We have ignition and full thrust on the RL-10. Chamber pressure on the RL-10 looks good. Body rate responses look good on the DCSS. And we have seen good indication of payload fairing jettison. Details of the clandestine mission aren't being revealed. But the giant 71-metre tall Delta IV Heavy's launch capabilities, combined with its flight path azimuth and tight launch window, suggest it was likely carrying an advanced Orion or Mentor Signet Signals Intelligence eavesdropping satellite. These giant 5,200kg spacecraft use giant 100-metre diameter radio reflecting dishes that's larger than the Parkes Radio Telescope to collect enemy radio transmissions from a 36,000 kilometre high geostationary orbit above the equator. The top-secret mission had been delayed by some three months following a string of technical and weather problems. First, there was a pneumatics issue which prevented its initial launch on August the 27th. A launch pad helium flow pressure regulator caused another delay on August the 29th. A third attempt on September the 26th was scrubbed following problems with one of the launch tower's propellant feed swing arm retraction systems. Further launch attempts in September were then cancelled, firstly because of bad weather, then because of hydraulic leaks with the launch pad's mobile gantry and swing arm retraction system, and then a faulty sensor aboard one of the rocket's RS-68 main engines. Ongoing problems with the Delta IV Heavy's launch pad are raising concerns about Pad 37B's ageing infrastructure. Remember, this was a launch pad originally built in the 1960s to support the Saturn I and Saturn IB rocket programs. The United Launch Alliance only has four more Delta IV launches left on its manifest. Two will be from Pad 37B at Cape Canaveral, but the other two will be from the Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. That will pretty well bring an end to the Delta IV and Atlas V launch vehicle program, as they're both retired and replaced with the new Vulcan Centaur rocket from the second half of next year. This is Space Time.
And time now for another brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with the Science Report. Small studies which have shown that men are more likely to develop severe COVID-19 have now been confirmed by a larger global analysis of more than 3 million patients. A report in the journal Nature Communications, which looked at data from 46 countries, found that while males and females appear equally likely to be infected with COVID-19, men are 2.84 times more likely to require intensive care than women. And the likelihood of men actually dying from COVID-19 was 1.39 times higher than that for women. While the researchers suggest that the differences in immune responses are suspected to be a factor, they speculate other biological factors may also have an influence. The COVID-19 coronavirus has now killed over 1.7 million people and infected some 75 million others since first spreading out of Wuhan, China, a year ago. Even in nations with strict online censorship laws, people can still bypass firewalls and access hidden information using the Onion Router Tor, which provides the largest anonymity internet network in the world. This dark web circumvents sensors, protecting personal data and activity from detection. It's used for all kinds of both legal and illegal activities. These range from people just wanting privacy through to drug dealing, gun running, terrorism, child porn and cyber hacking. Now, a new study reported in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences by researchers at Virginia Tech have found that the potentially harmful activities within the TOR system are not uniformly spread around the world but appear to be disproportionately concentrated in democratic nations, while people in countries with repressive totalitarian regimes tend to use tall, more for political discourse. The authors found that only 6.7% of users globally are using tall for malicious purposes, and most tall users tend to head to regular benign web content, using it more as a hyper-private version of Chrome or Firefox. A new study has confirmed that Neanderthals buried their dead. The findings, published in the journal Scientific Reports, are based on the study of the remains of a Neanderthal child that was buried around 41,000 years ago. Dozens of buried Neanderthal skeletons have been discovered in Eurasia, leading some scientists to deduce that, like modern humans, Homo sapiens, Neanderthals also buried their dead. But many scientists have remained sceptical. That's because the majority of the best-preserved skeletons were uncovered at the start of the 20th century and so weren't excavated using modern archaeological techniques. However, a site in France which delivered six Neanderthals in the early 20th century delivered a seventh in the 1970s and it did use modern archaeological techniques. The new research showed that the remains belonging to a two-year-old Neanderthal child was purposely placed in a purpose-dug grave. Well, we've all heard the old saying that dogs look like their owners, but now a Swedish research team have shown that in fact many owners eat and exercise like their dogs. A report in the British Medical Journal has found that people who have a dog with diabetes were 38% more likely to develop type 2 diabetes themselves. And it's a similar story the other way around too, with dogs 28% more likely to develop diabetes when their owners had the illness. A possible explanation is shared lifestyle behaviours between dogs and their owners, such as activity levels and diets. And of course, when you have those little snackies, how can you say no to those big doggy eyes? There's a new malware threat targeting your computer. With news on this and Apple's plans to develop their own 5G modem, we're joined by Alex of royt from ity.com. Yeah, Microsoft has put out through its Defender Research team, a warning that there is a new malware threat called Adrozek, and this is targeting Microsoft Edge, Google Chrome, the Yandex browser from Russia, and Mozilla Firefox. And what it's doing is it's taking over the ads that normally you would see from Google or from other ad providers, and it's putting its own ads in there. Obviously, that is capturing a lot of the ad revenue from you know that people are seeing, and also through advertising affiliate programs. But also, it's got malware on your computer. It's modifying DLL, DLL files from your browser. It's modifying the browser files. And obviously, these days, the bad guys are trying to get past the uh, different anti-malware programs that are out there uh, because, you know, if they can, if they can capture uh, even a tiny percentage of the enormous traffic on the internet, they can make a lot of money. So clearly this is a warning that, you know, a lot of people I come across their computers and I see they have weird pop-ups. I have a look in Google Chrome and I see weird extensions that they're unaware that are there and they're not running something like malware bytes or, you know, they're not running the latest internet security software. Now, Microsoft is saying that its own 
Windows Defender or the built-in antivirus in Windows 10 can handle this. But personally, I'd be getting something like Malwarebytes, whether the free version or the paid version that proactively targets these sorts of things. And I'd be running a, you know, a, as clean a computer as possible with as few extensions as possible. I know people love to put extensions to the, up the wazoo in uh, Firefox and Fiery and Chrome. I like to run no extensions, very few extensions, uh, it, you know, basically none, because that way your browser experience is fast and clean and you avoid weird pop-ups and these weird ads and uh, just the consequences of having malware in your computer. I mean, the big threat in 2021 is going to, going to be the exfiltration of data, which will then be held to ransom. So not only will the bad guys be encrypting your computer and demanding a ransomware, but they'll also steal the data off your computer and then contact you. And this is normally for companies, not for individuals, but they'll say, look, we've got your customer databases, we have your IP, pay us even more money or we'll release this and embarrass you. So it's very, very important to make sure you have as much security software on your computer as possible. I mean, without going overboard, you don't want to have every single program out there. But even though Microsoft is saying that their software can detect this new AdRosec malware, I certainly wouldn't be relying upon the built-in security of uh, Windows. And in fact, I'd be getting a Mac. I mean, I stopped using Windows about a decade ago. News from Apple regarding a 5G modem. Yes, well, Apple has always been trying to make its own technologies. We saw this most recently with its new M1 processors. Uh, but one of the things it's been trying to do for some time is work on its own 5G modems. Apple famously broke off with Qualcomm a couple of years ago. They had a big lawsuit against each other. Apple was relying upon Intel to make 5G modems, and Intel couldn't quite do it. So Apple ended up buying Intel's modem division for a billion US dollars and signed to deal with Qualcomm. And of course, now with the iPhone 12 models, the 5G chip inside is a Qualcomm chip. But Apple doesn't like that. They like to have their own technologies, their own graphics and processing units, their own CPU. And they've done that with, with as many technologies as, as they can. And the next one off the rank is the 5G modems. So future Apple devices, including the Macs and the MacBooks, will come with the Apple's own brand of 5G modem. They haven't quite worked on it yet, but uh, there's been news this week that they're definitely wrapping that up. The Johnny Sroji, the senior vice president of hardware technology at Apple, talked about how they kicked off uh, their first internal cellular modem, which will enable another key strategic transition. So they've kicked that off this year in earnest. And um, you know they will have that ready in the next couple of years, no doubt, and then they won't need Qualcomm. Inside your iPad, inside your iPhone and inside future Macs, there'll be a little modem, which is basically a, a shrunken version of the modem that you have sitting powering your fiber optic or video cell connection. And obviously, it's just a chip on the motherboard with some supporting chips, and it connects to the antennas that are in the phone, tablet, or computer. And it talks to the wireless signals that are in the air. That's Alex Hauer of Royd from ITWire.com. That's the show for now. Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favorite podcast download provider, and from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Space Time store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. Or by becoming a Space Time patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group and other rewards. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.com for full details. And if you want more space time, please check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram through our Spacetime YouTube channel. And on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. And Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 